Today, February 1st, 2023, is the 20-year anniversary of the Columbia disaster. This video will explain what caused the violent, explosive breakup at re-entry and what happened to the seven astronaut remains. It also explains what my crew and my involvement was in the recovery effort. I omitted any individual finger pointing and I did not go into detail of how NASA failed to protect the crew. This video is a respectful memorial to the crew who lost their lives and to the families who were left behind to bear the grief. Watch the video and please keep the crew's final moments in your minds and hearts. The seven member crew of STS-107 were selected in July of 2000. The mission was commanded by Rick Husband, who was a colonel of the U.S. Air Force and a test pilot. He had previously flown an STS-96. The mission pilot was William McCool, a U.S. Navy commander who was on his first space flight. Payload commander was Michael Anderson, a U.S. Air Force lieutenant colonel who had previously flown an STS-89. Kalpana Chawala served as flight engineer and she had previously flown an STS-87. David Brown, Laura Clark, both Navy captains, flew as mission specialists on their first space flights. Ilan Ramon, a colonel in the Israeli Air Force, was the first Israeli astronaut and flew as payload specialist. Columbia was the first space shuttle in the fleet to go into space on April 1981. The Space Shuttle Columbia disaster was a fatal accident in the United States space program that occurred on February 1, 2003. After completing its mission, STS-107, Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated as it re-entered the atmosphere over Texas, killing all seven astronauts on board. The mission was the second that ended in a disaster in the Space Shuttle program after the loss of Challenger. During STS-107 launch, a piece of insulation foam broke off the space shuttle external tank and struck the thermal protective system TPS tiles on the orbiter's left wing. Columbia was scheduled to re-enter the atmosphere and land on February 1, 2003. At 3.30 a.m. Eastern Time, the entry flight control team started its shift at Mission Control Center. On board the orbiter, the crew stowed loose items and repaired their equipment for re-entry. At 45 minutes prior to the orbit burn, Husband and McCool began working through the entry checklist. At 8.10 a.m., Capsule Communicator Capcom informed the crew that they were approved to conduct a deorbit burn. At 8.15 a.m. and 30 seconds, the crew successfully executed the orbit burn, which lasted for 2 minutes and 38 seconds. At 8.44 a.m. and 9 seconds, Columbia re-entered the atmosphere at an altitude of 400,000 feet, a point named Entry Interface. Four and a half minutes after Entry Interface, a sensor began recording greater than normal amounts of strain on the left wing. The sensor's data was recorded to an internal recorder, but not transmitted to the crew or ground. 
The orbiter began to yaw to the left as a result of the increased drag on the left wing, but this was not noticed by the crew or mission control because of the corrections from the orbiter's flight control system. This was followed by sensors in the left wheel well reporting a rise in temperature. Columbia reentry image taken by Starfire Optical Ranger near Albuquerque, New Mexico shows debris is visible coming from the left wing on the bottom. At 8.53 a.m. and 46 seconds, Columbia crossed over the California coast. It was traveling at Mach 23 at an altitude of 231,600 feet. And the temperature of its wings leading edges was estimated to be 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit or 1,500 degrees Celsius. Soon after it entered California airspace, the orbiter shed several pieces of debris which were observed in, on the ground as sudden increases in brightness of the air around the orbiter. The MMACS officer reported that hydraulic sensors in the left wing had readings below the sensor's minimum. Columbia continued to re-enter and traveled over Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, where observers would report seeing signs of debris being shed. At 8.58 a.m. and three seconds, the orbiter's aileron trim changed from a predictive value from the increased drag caused by the damage in the left wing. At 8.58 a.m. and 21 seconds, the orbiter shed a TPS tile that would later land in Littlefield, Texas. It would become the westernmost piece of recovered debris. The crew first received indication of a problem at 8.59 a.m. and 39 seconds when the backup flight software monitor began displaying fault messages for loss of pressure in the tires on, of the left landing gear. Here, here, here. The pilot and commander then received indications that the status of the left landing gear was unknown, as different sensors reported the gear was down and locked, as well as still up in stowed position. The drag of the left wing continued to yaw the orbiter to the left until it could no longer be corrected using aileron trim, and the orbiter reaction control system began firing its thrusters continuously to correct its orientation. The loss of signal, LOS, from Columbia occurred at 8.59 a.m. and 32 seconds. Mission Control stopped receiving information from the orbiter at this time, and husband's last radio call was Roger Uh and was cut off mid-transmission. One of the channels in the flight control software was bypassed as a result of a failed wire, and a master alarm began sounding on the flight deck. Most of control of the orbiter is estimated to have begun several seconds later with the loss of hydraulic pressure an uncontrolled pitch-up maneuver. The orbiter began flying along a ballistic trajectory, which was significantly steeper and had more drag than the previous gliding trajectory. The or orbiter, while still traveling faster than Mach 15, entered into a flat spin of 30 degrees to 40 degrees per second. The acceleration that the crew experienced increased from approximately 0.8 G's to 3 G's, which would have likely caused dizziness and disorientation, but not incapacitation. The autopilot switched to manual control and reset automatic mode at 9 a.m. and 3 seconds. This would have required input from either husband or McCool indicating that they were still conscious and able to perform functions at the time. All hydraulic pressure was lost and McCool's final switch configuration indicated that he had tried to restore hydraulic system at some time after 9 a.m. and 5 seconds. At 9 a.m. and 18 seconds, the orbiter began the catastrophic breakup 
and all on board data recording soon ceased. Ground observers noted a sudden increase in debris being shed and the on board system lost power. By 9 a.m. at 25 seconds, the orbiter's fore and aft sections had separated from one another. The sudden jerk caused the crew compartment to collide with the interior wall of the fuselage, resulting in the depressurization of the crew compartment at 9 a.m. and 35 seconds. Pieces of the orbiter continued to break apart into smaller pieces, and within a minute after breakup, they were too small to be detected from ground-based videos. The level of acceleration they experienced during crew module breakup was not lethal. The first lethal event the crew experienced was a depressurization of the crew module. The rate and exact time of depressurization could not be determined, but occurred no later than 9 a.m. and 59 seconds. At 9.35 a.m., all debris and crew remains were estimated to have impacted the ground. The remains of the crew members indicated that they all experienced depressurization. The astronauts' helmets have a visor that when closed can temporarily protect the crew member from depressurization. Some of the crew members had not closed their visors and one was not wearing a helmet, indicating that depressurization occurred quickly before they could take protective measures. During and after the breakup of the crew module, the crew either unconscious or dead experienced rotation on all three axes. The astronauts' shoulder harnesses were unable to prevent trauma to their upper bodies, as the inertia reel system failed to retract significantly to secure them, leaving them only restrained by their lap belts. Additionally, the helmets were not conformal to the crew members' heads, allowing the head injuries inside the helmets. The neck ring of the helmets may have also acted as a fulcrum, causing spine and neck injuries. The physical trauma to the astronauts who could not brace to prevent such injuries could have also resulted in their deaths. The astronauts also likely suffered from significant thermal trauma. Hot gases entered the disintegrating crew module, burning the crew members whose bodies were still somewhat protected by their eight CES suits. Once the crew module fell apart, the astronauts were violently exposed to wind blasts and possible shock waves, which stripped away their suits, leaving them unprotected. The crew's remains were exposed to hot gases and molten metal as they fell away from the orbiter. After separation from the crew module, the bodies of the crew members entered an environment with almost no oxygen, very low atmospheric pressure, and both high temperatures from deceleration and extremely low ambient temperatures. Ultimately, their bodies impacted the ground with lethal levels of force. My crew and I were tasked with supplying airlift for the NASA recovery team, supply medical staffing, sealed caskets, and any air support that was needed. We loaded up the medical evacuation crew and flew down to Dover Air Force Base, where we picked up eight metal sealed caskets for the recovered astronaut remains. Although there were only seven crew members, the eighth casket was for any unidentified remains that were recovered. We flew down to NASA Space Center in Florida and we were informed that they didn't expect any survivors and it was no longer a medical rescue mission, but a search and recovery mission. We loaded up the NASA recovery team and their needed supplies and flew half of them to Dallas and the other half to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. After two days on standby, it was clear that we were no 
going to bring back any human remains at Dover Air Force Base. So we were released of our airlift obligation. We offloaded the caskets of Barksdale Air Force Base and returned back to our home base in New Jersey. Debris was reported from West Texas through Southern Louisiana. Recovery crews and local volunteers worked to locate and identify debris. On the first day of the disaster, searchers began finding remains of the astronauts. Within three days of the crash, some remains were, of every crew member had been recovered. These recoveries occurred along the line of south of Hampill, Texas, and west of Toledo Bend Reservoir. The final body of a crew member was recovered on February 11th. The crew remains were transported for the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology at Dover Air Force Base. The search for Columbia debris ended in May. Approximately 83,900 pieces of debris were recovered, weighing 84,900 pounds which was about 38% of the orbiter's overall weight. About 40,000 recovered pieces of debris have never been identified. Rest in peace, crew of STS-107. they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. Thank you. So let us go forward to create our world of tomorrow in faith, in unity, and in love. God bless you and God bless America.